we are going to talk about uh, basics of ASD closure. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeremy Aznes. Um, I've known Jeremy for a, a, a very long time, and he is uh, currently at Yale, uh, and he's an associate professor of pediatrics and uh, section chief of pediatric cardiology. Um, he's trained at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in Mount Sinai, won multiple awards. Um, and uh, Jeremy, over to you, um, and we're all looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate the invitation to, to talk with you all. Uh, so my talk is about uh, secundum ASD closure. Uh, my sense is probably that this audience has a good bit of familiarity with this defect. Um, the, uh, I just wanted to quickly review the guidelines for closing ASDs. These are the European uh, adult congenital guidelines. Um, and uh, per these guidelines, ASD closure is recommended in patients who have right ventricular volume overload and the absence of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the European guidelines do not require symptoms. It's a little bit different than the US guidelines where symptoms are part of the uh, decision tree. Um, the recommended closure method in Europe is with device closure. Uh, that's really supplanted surgery uh, for the vast majority of cases. Uh, there's a rather complicated algorithm to work through in terms of uh, appropriateness of closure in the in presence or absence of pulmonary hypertension uh, and in the presence or absence of left ventricular disease. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the various uh, aspects of that algorithm. I'll leave that um, to you all. Um, the, there's a little bit of difference in the devices that we have available uh, in our different locations. Um, in the U.S., the the available devices currently are the Amplatz or Cephalocluder, which is currently uh, produced by Abbott, uh, and the Gore Cephalocluder, which I don't believe you have. Uh, so I'm going to stick to talking about the Amplatz or device, um, and I believe you have the Aquatec device, which we don't have yet. Um, so in any discussion of atrial septal defect closure, uh, the focus uh, at the beginning is certainly on the rims of the defect. So looking into the, right, uh, into the right atrium, we can see a large secundum ASD. They're never round, they're always somewhat oval. Um, and if we overlay uh, the rims on top of that image, we can start to have a shared understanding uh, of what the rims are. And this is crucial to have this understanding with your echocardiographer so that you're speaking the same language uh, as you're uh, doing the procedure. So we keep actually in our lab, we keep this uh, graphic on our echo machine so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, looking around the defect, the rim that has gotten the most focus is the aortic rim, um, which is up in this location. Uh, the ascending aorta and aortic root are just behind uh, the wall of the right atrium here and the septum sort of straddles the aorta. Um, these defects, if there's deficiency in this rim, are certainly closable. You have to be concerned about uh, the potential for device erosion, as erosion is much more common uh, in patients with deficiencies in the rim uh, at the aorta and the superior rim here and the SVC rim. So these rims are really critical to assess during any closure. The IVC rim um, is necessary for device stability. Deficiencies in the IVC rim, if they're small, are certainly tolerable. Often when devices are placed, there will be a residual shunt, um, but those uh, sometimes close, and if they don't, you're usually left with a pretty small shunt. Large deficiencies of that rim will preclude using a device for closure. The AV valve rim uh, also would, if there's absence or significant deficiency of that rim, that would preclude closure because the device would interact with the leaflets of the mitral and tricuspid valves. Posterior rim deficiency, again, can be overcome uh, if there's a small segment of posterior rim deficiency. It can make uh, device placement more challenging, but typically the device can be placed uh, securely so long as the remaining, the remaining rims uh, are significant. The echocardiographic views uh, are uh, really important to understand as the catheterizer uh, so that you again can have that shared language with your uh, echocardiographer. Um, the 
four chamber view from the mid esophagus lets us look very nicely at the, uh, the AV valve rim. Looking at the aortic rim, uh, usually we come to somewhere between 45 and 65 degrees on the TE probe. And you can see in this patient, there's severe deficiency of the aortic rim here with essentially a bald aorta uh, for some portion of, of the uh, uh, component of the septum. That would make this closure challenging, but certainly doable. A view that I like to use is uh, what I call the atrial roof sweep. I ask the echocardiographer to go to zero degrees and to slowly uh, move the TEE probe uh, from high up in the esophagus downward. And this gives you a very nice sense of where the deficiencies in the rims are uh, on the superior side. So if the SVC is here, as soon as we enter the right atrium and left atrium, LA here, RA is going to show up here. As soon as we get to the RA, we see a, a fairly large gap between the SVC uh, and the aorta. So there's uh, superior rim deficiency and uh, aortic rim deficiency in this patient. Another way to look at that is to do uh, a sweep in the 90 degree view. So as we sweep from right to left, we'll start over by the SVC here in just a second. Here's the SVC. Then we have this uh, superior rim that's absent, uh, and then we get to the aorta and there's deficiency, and then the rim shows up again. So these are good views to do at baseline, uh, just to really get a good understanding of the defect. We're particularly concerned about the aortic rim because of the potential for the device to interact with, oops, with the aorta. Uh, these are some nice uh, specimens that show how intimately involved the aorta and the atrial septum are. Um, and on the right side here and on the left side here. And uh, in the absence of rim up here to keep the device away from the aorta. Recording in progress. Uh, the pulsatility of the aorta and the pressure of the device up onto this rim can result in injury to the aortic wall. And we can see that in this example here. Um, here's a Amplatz or ASD device uh, being removed by a surgeon. We can see with the overlay here that the aortic rim is sitting right up in this area here. This patient presented with tamponade. Um, and you can see that the device has uh, entered the wall of the atrium here, right at the aortic rim, and cut its way through the wall and uh, up to the aorta. To avoid these kinds of issues, uh, we've moved away from what used to be called the stretch diameter measurement of the defect. So here we're using a sizing balloon to size the ASD and inflating that balloon till we see a nice waist. And that used to be measured as the waist for the, for the size of the device. We've moved away from that since the recognition of erosion and moved over to uh, what we call the stop flow diameter. So this is a image from uh, with a balloon across the atrial defect. You can see uh, we're in a little, uh, roughly 90 degree view, um, and we can see that there's still a, a leak here. Here's the inferior portion of the septum, the balloon, and two, we can see the power flow here. Here we would just slightly increase the volume in the balloon to eliminate that, and then we would measure the balloon, uh, as you can see up here, without looking for a waste. So I mentioned there can be some challenging anatomies. Aortic rim deficiency and superior rim deficiency uh, are among the most challenging. Septal aneurysms also, when the, when the septum primum is very floppy, can make it quite difficult to stably implant a device. Large defects in excess of 25 millimeters similarly uh, can be challenging. So let's look at a couple of techniques to help in those situations. Um, the first set, I would call modified device positioning techniques, and those don't require any additional equipment and they don't require any additional access. Uh, so they're a little bit uh, more friendly in terms of resource utilization. Those involve the left, up, left upper pulmonary vein deployment. This is one that I use uh, somewhat frequently. Uh, our delivery catheter is positioned up into the left upper pulmonary vein and you extrude the device 
uh, into the pulmonary vein, you want to be sure not to cross too distally. So we use the left bronchus as an indicator of uh, not going too deep. The device is partially uncovered in the left uh, upper pulmonary vein, and then rather rapidly unsheathed across the defect so that the waist of the device is stretched through the defect. Uh, and then with some manipulation of the delivery cable, a little bit of movement forward, uh, and sometimes a little bit of pull back, the left disc will snap out of the pulmonary vein and quickly reform uh, and allow you to capture uh, what can be a difficult uh, defect to close. Uh, similarly, this can be done from the right upper pulmonary vein, same technique. I don't have a graphic um, for that, unfortunately. Uh, Dr. Uh, Amin did not do that drawing. Uh, these are wonderful drawings that, that he has though. So similarly, right upper pulmonary vein deployment. This is one I use quite regularly as well. Um, again, a little bit of tension and pushing on the cable for the delivery and the, this disc will pop out of the right pulmonary vein and form up quickly, uh, allowing you to capture particularly in uh, deficient uh, aortic rooms. There's a, also an LA roof deployment. This is not one that I've used terribly frequently, but can be very helpful in small left atria when there's not enough room to open the device uh, from superior to inferior. Um, you can open the device, the left atrial disc at the roof of the left atrium, extrude the device, uh, sort of unsheath the device through the defect, and then again, quickly uh, do a little bit of tugging on the uh, delivery system and the device, the left atrial disc will snap down from the roof uh, and grab the rim. Another technique uh, that's out there is to use uh, a wire to stabilize the device. Uh, this is a paper from uh, Dr. Carminati's group in Italy. Um, you can see that uh, you can stick a needle through the device and that allows you to advance a guide wire through the device. So if you position a guide wire in the right upper pulmonary vein, uh, bring it down, uh, leave it in your long sheath. You can then, when you load the device, stick the needle through the right atrial disc and out through the waist in the device. And that lets you load the wire uh, backward through the device. And then as you advance the device over the wire, the wire stays in position. The wire keeps the left atrial disc uh, at this angle. It does not allow the disc to flop down and prolapse through. Uh, and once you have grabbed that superior aspect of the septum, you can simply pull the wire through. It's important not to use uh, a J wire. Uh, usually to do this, we'll use a, a Turumo or a slippery type wire so that we don't get any tugging on the um, device itself. Uh, and then a technique that was described uh, quite some time ago by the group in India was the balloon assisted technique. In this, um, you leave your sizing balloon across the defect and you deploy your left atrial disc. And as you pull that disc up against the septum, you can see the septum, the plane of the septum is right about here where the notch in the balloon is. The balloon keeps the left atrial disc uh, on the left side and allows you to uh, grasp that superior rim. And then you gradually deflate the balloon and slip it through the defect, leaving the device edge uh, caught up uh, on that superior rim. There is a modification of that uh, that was uh, provided for us with the balloon staying low in the atrial septum and the device being deployed in the right upper pulmonary vein. And instead of catching the superior part of the device, you're sort of pushing the device upward uh, by catching the inferior portion of the disc. Uh, and then as you form up the device, again, you deflate the balloon and slowly withdraw it. Thank you, Jeremy. I think we're- uh, We up, okay. Yeah, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, All right, no problem. But if you if you have a few, few minutes, I'm sure we have a, a, a lot of questions for you. Um, and I'll, I can start off. Uh, somehow, our patient population never has a retroaortic rim. Uh, it's always deficient. Um, and so what would be kind of your red line beyond which? And, and you know, we typically end up using a balloon-assisted deployment for these patients uh, with either an Amplatzer or an Oculotech device. Just our experience with Oculotech is it's it's... Uh, the wire thickness is less as compared to an amplatzer, so it tends to deform sometimes and almost uh, becomes this funnel shape permanently and doesn't um, doesn't go back to its uh, uh, shape that it's supposed to. 
uh, but we do balloon assisted deployments. What's your red line or what's your cutoff uh, for deficient rims uh, or ASD size plus a deficient rim that you would not attempt um, uh, to close it? Yeah, so I, I certainly get nervous even in, in smaller defects. Um, the, the wire thickness for the Amplatzer devices jumps up after the 18 millimeter device. And um, so, uh, and the, the data from the registries has shown that the larger the device, the, the higher the risk for erosion. So if there's, uh, you know, complete deficiency, uh, if there's really a bald aorta and significant uh, floppiness of the inferior septum so that you have to oversize the device, I typically will not use the Amplatzer device. I will switch and use the Gore device, which has not uh, been associated with erosion at this point. Uh, so um, I think it's a bit of a judgment call. Uh, it's somewhat of a decision that I make with the patient as well. I think the risk of erosion is still incredibly low. You know, we're talking about a risk that's significantly less than uh, half a percent. Um, but we know that in that in that group of patients with deficiency superiorly in, uh, at the aortic rim, uh, that that risk is higher, but we can't quantify. Great. I think Dr. Asad has a question for you. Uh, Jeremy, great talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. You. Yes. So just, uh, just following on from Osman's question, uh, what we also see here in our population uh, is actually uh, multiple ASDs uh, sometimes. So uh, usually there is one big one, and then you have this sort of fenestrated septum, which has a couple of further small ones as well. So would you send them for surgery, or would you try closing the big one and leave the smaller ones and maybe hope that once the device endothelializes, you'll get away with it? Yeah, so I, I think it's, that's a great question. So I think in the fenestrated defects, um, in some ways they offer an advantage because if you can land the device in the fenestration um, and it's close enough to the large defect, you can sort of use that as a, a, a way to keep yourself away from the aorta. Um, the, um, I think it depends a lot for me on, on uh, how much of the atrial communication I can get closed. So if the goal is really to reduce the shunt to an, an acceptable amount, you don't have to completely close every hole. If you're left with a little three millimeter hole, I think that's perfectly reasonable result. So uh, I would say if, if, you, if you can land a device in such a way that you can eliminate the vast majority of the shunt, then I think you, you can get away with just doing that. Um, if there are multiple fenestrations low in the septum and there's a very large defect uh, superiorly and you really can't close off the majority of the shunt, then I would send that patient for surgery. Okay, um, uh, I had a question for Dr. Farkad <clears throat> Um and um, you know it's uh, the the data for MitraClip. Can we give him a mic, please, Dr. Farkad? So the data for uh, MitraClip with time, with long-term follow-up for the uh, uh, index trials has looked uh, better and better. Um, in Pakistan, we've had some fair success with TAVR, which is also an expensive procedure. And I know MitraClip is um, uh, substantially more expensive. But if you take cost out of the equation, what do you think some of the hurdles are in terms of starting a, a, you know, a successful uh, CLIP program in Pakistan? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Uh, you have actually mentioned the ma major obstacle, which is actually you've taken out of this, uh, which is the financial aspect. It costs nearly seven million, uh, whereas a tower would cost three. It costs seven million. And then uh, if you look at the uh, Pakistani population, uh, most cases that we I have seen are more functional, that also dilated cardiomyopathy, where you have to be very careful when you ask somebody to spend six, seven million rupees and say that mm, you may get better, but we haven't sorted the problem out. The ventricle is still sick. It's just the understanding. It's just how you make people aware of the, you see, uh, some cases where I've seen where I've done a clip and the ventricle is poor, the minute the left atrial pressure goes down, you feel 
a sense of relief that this man is going to benefit in the long term, at, at least symptomatically. In Pakistan, it is really there is only one thing which is uh, not letting it spread, which is cost mm -hmm. and, and lack of awareness uh, of uh, what you can do. Sometimes people with uh, cardiomyopathies, you can't even give them optimal therapy. This is again very particular to Pakistan. Their blood pressures are 80, they all have kidney problems, they all have diabetes. Mitoclip in those cases actually allows you to optimize therapy. You can actually, once you clip, you reduce mitral regurgitation, left atrial pressure, you can actually in optimize therapy as well. It's, it's, a, it's a battle that we are continuing to fight, but uh, I think cost is the major. So in terms of, uh, I mean, from my experience in the, in the U.S., uh, even centers in the U.S., the volumes have not reached what they thought they would, uh, even though mitral valve disease is very prevalent, probably much more so than aortic valve disease. So do you think the patient selection, it sounds like it's key to select the right patient who would benefit the most from it? You see, if you look at the two uh, groups, degenerative, we are only looking at people with prohibitive surgical risk. We're not looking at any other patients, you know, who, who surgery is still the gold standard. It's the functional where there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And obviously case selection, what Mitra FR, actually, you know, I'm, I was actually involved in a way that I proctored most of the centers in France when they were doing Mitra FR. Mm -hmm. And the problem was very clear to see that they were inexperienced operators, patients were not on good medical therapy, patients were not followed up, a lot of them had very slight regurg. And you had to really give inotropes to create the regurg and to see where it is. And there are a lot of issues with Mitra FR, but it has shown you what not to do in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, co-apt, uh, we are much more encouraged if that patient selection is, you know, if you're choosing ventricles less than seven centimeters, ejection fraction above 25, people have optimal medical therapy. If need be, they have had CRT then yes, but all these things have to be kept in mind. It's not like TAVI, you have an aortic stenosis, you remove the stenosis, you get better. There are so many other things playing in the mitral uh, patients that you have to be patient, you have to go through those steps and then. So all these things can actually uh, have led to, you know, but still a lot of patients have been done, nearly 250,000 now worldwide, right. maybe even more, Right. slowly. Great. Thank you. Any questions from the panelists? Question regarding mitral cliff. Uh, sir, we suddenly switch from the uh, volume overload to pressure overload. Which are the flocks which tolerate this uh, properly? Uh, means uh, in terms of LV dimension, in terms of uh, EF and all this, are there any gradation between these? Because Suddenly, obviously, if there is a very poor LV and there is a sudden pressure overload, so do they tolerate it as the other flock? I, uh, you see, what I understand from the question is that are there some patients who do not tolerate mitral clip, especially if the ventricles are very poor? So in about uh, close to 700 cases that I've been involved in, there have been a few, one or two, where we have had to unclip very quickly because immediately post-clipping there was stasis, spontaneous contrast everywhere and the patient could not tolerate. But these are very few cases and if you prepare them, like in those sort of cases, we give some inotropes for a 24 to 48 hours before, sometimes even used a balloon pump and all these things, then you can actually get reasonably good results. But yes, patient selection, there are a group that you should not be going near they need to be, have just medical therapy, with, especially with poor ventricles. Yep, go ahead, Ali. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, I think I've got a loud voice. You will be able to hear me. So um, uh, from uh, Dr. Alabgir, my question is that since your friends have moved from Abbott to uh, Edward Sapiens now, so what do you think about Pascal coming to the Pakistan now? <laughs> uh, my friends, yes, the, you know, yes, Martin, you mean Martin, yes. The, the thing is that Pascal is a, based on the same, you know, concept, but obviously with a bigger central drum, which we say. 
less complications, less chance of it getting caught in the cords. I've not had a great experience, but when it was first launched, I was involved in a few cases. But I hear that it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a similar concept, but with uh, lesser chance of getting caught up in cords. And if they offer us a deal, if they drop the price to something similar to a TAVI, then of course we'll be doing a lot of them, which I doubt. Great. I think uh, any questions from the audience?